shared group is an interesting way of, or interesting, really interesting thing for a cluster house. You can make it so that all the machines boot off of the same disk. All of them, and everyone is running JMS off that disk. So that when you install packages um, or install a program, all those machines can see it uh, immediately. So it makes your configuration a lot simpler because instead of if you have a cluster of uh, 10 machines, you don't have to install it 10 times. You install it once and all the machines will see it immediately. Um, then there's also scientific uh, clusters, which is kind of where the GFS community started. Uh, it started in a big group, computer work group at the university. And um, there were big clusters just like There were just massive data sets that needed to get turned to for like uh, genome genomes <coughs> and oil and gas. And there were a bunch of people that we all wanted to get to the data set.
say you know, if the first machine crashes and you replay that journal, you do not want to replay that old data over top of the new data that the third machine um, changed. So you have to, to worry about journaling replay things like that that in some way. But LG walking has more overhead um, basically because uh, you get a lock per file and when you're turning through uh, lots of files you have basically lots of locks you need to get. And um, since the locality thing I was talking about, they're not quite as clumped together anymore. Um, another thing is uh, avoid central data structures, inode tables. Um, so in order to convert an inode number to a disk address, uh, that can be centralized if you built it the wrong way. So you have to do that um, in, in a way that doesn't create a lot of that. Static has to go. So if you're doing a DF in a local file system, you just the super block has the all the DF information in it. Um, that's not true with GFS because if it was, every time you did not update the DLP, you'd have to change that centralized data structure. And that would just create a bottleneck that would kill you performance. So things are spread out in GFS. Um, and we to, so we tried to be as close to the as possible. There are some places where you do get that one value that, that everybody is doing, that doing something needs a change. Um, and we do a little bit of relaxing quotas. We, um, if you think about quotas, they're basically the current value of how many how many blocks the user is allocated is can be a bottleneck. So we try and um, relax things a little bit. So quotas are, are uh, it's possible to overrun quotas, but, but there are mechanisms to make sure that that quote that overrun is limited and we can accept the value. Um, and things like a time um, are, are kind of hard to do as well. So, so a time is fuzzy. It's kept accurate within a certain quantum that we specify. Um, so, the internal layout of GFS. Uh, so, the file system sits between the GFS and the volume number, the CLD number, or whatever. Uh, it also has this GLOC layer that uh, basically lets it talk to these cluster managers. So, Dome is one of them, centralized cluster. And then there's a DMAN, a DLM, and CMAN combination that basically uh, does these metrics. Um, so GFS, the, the very interesting thing to see is GFS only knows how to talk um, through the block layer, doing block commands, and it knows how to talk to block modules. So GFS doesn't care what type of um, data transport happens at all. It's all transferred to it. So you can have IP down there, you can have um, infinite band if you have the right type of work for the, to get IP to work for the uh, block manager. So the file system um, is very abstract. Um, so, I have just this big list of features that I'll kind of breeze through. Um, so, asynchronous journaling, which is journaling in part of the We have that. Multiple journals I've talked about. We have X-hash directories, which means uh, basically the directories are hashed. You can have um, uh, directly as many, many entries as find anyone very quickly. Uh, you can have space and journals as you go. Uh, there's log caching and reading write caching. So you can get Okay. Um, so we have dynamic high notes, so you don't have to worry about pre-allocating high notes and make it us. This is number of bits that have a time. Um, and lock, they lock away through lock source. So when you have to acquire multiple locks to perform a transaction, you um, sort them to make sure you get them in the right order. Okay, um, so two, four, four two was the branching point for the of us. So, these are some of the things that we added uh, to Cena um, that are, are, are new to the, the, the codebase that people can see now. Uh, so asynchronous logging. So before you, if you had to acquire a bunch of blocks, you would tell it to acquire one, <coughs> wait for it to come back, and then acquire the next one, and wait for it to come back. Now you can fire up a, a whole slew of block requests, and they come back as they come back. And um, it, it's a good performance increase. So quotas. Um, I'm going to give it back a few more slides on them later. Uh, extended attributes act with all these normal file system things that um, everybody expects to be there. And the file system is, is so important in Unix. There are just so many different little things that go into it. Um, that it took us a while to get all these things in there. Um, shared locks are, are really shared uh, kind of uh, defect in the code. Um, so we do direct I.O. Um, and direct I.O. is set up so that if you're doing non-allocating writes, you can do writes in parallel. So for a database um, that's doing direct out of the disk, you 
can do as many reads and writes to the, the, the file or the database in parallel as you want. Um, lots of improvements. Um, journal data in support, process compressing support. So if you're doing snapshots in uh, the, the volume manager and the hardware manager, you can tell the file system to, um, you can run one command on one machine that tells the whole file system to stop writing and mark the file system as clean. And then you do your hardware snapshot or your, 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 your block layer snapshot, and you can hit another switch that will let the cluster go on again. So you can do that type of snapshots for backups and things like that. Um, more improvements. Uh, yeah, basically more improvements. Oh, the other thing, a shared memory mapping. So you can um, do a shared memory map of a file on multiple machines and then start accessing that memory. And it's coherent across the machine or across the cluster. So by doing a write to a byte on one machine, the next read of that byte on any other machine will, will have a good memory, which is kind of neat. So it's basically distributed shared memory. Um, so we also have context-dependent path names. So there are tags that you can put in your, your file names that uh, when GFS sees that tag, it will replace the host name or the um, machine type. So, so you can have stuff in the cluster that's specific to a certain node or specific to uh, a certain type of architecture. So if you're running a mixed cluster where um, you're running RPC and PCs together, you can have it so that it transparently labels over different directories for like one or um, So some a little bit more detail on some of these features. Um, so asynchronous locking, um, so local lock modules and that G-lock layer I showed you uh, basically got changed to the, uh, so you, there's a callback that the lock module can send to the, the file system. So you send out a request, it remembers that you did the request, and when the request is that's why it calls back. Um, so there are, so you can do prefetching. So when you're doing an LS of a directory, uh, in order to do even an LS that has, um, like an LS that shall have that stats every file, um, JFS will send out prefetches for all those files so that um, you're not waiting sync or sequentially for to do the stats. Um, so that's one thing. Um, you can also do asynchronous requests that you wait on. Uh, so set of us works that way. So each chunk of allocation bitmap has its own statistics to tell it how many blocks are allocated in your pre, how many your I nodes. And um, set of us it will have a bunch of slots and it will start firing out requests for those each of those allocation bitmaps. And, um, so basically, you do those stats of, of the allocation all parallel, and um, you want faster. Unlock is another big thing. So before the first piece of code did synchronous unlock, and it had to try to lock whatever process was the last one to touch it would end up having to sit there and wait for the response to come back saying it was unlocked. Right now, we just do a synchronous unlock. So you tell the service, that, or you tell the block module, unlock this, and you can forget about it, and when it gets the call back, it, it handles the rest of the unlocking to the um, So quotas. Uh, quotas are, are, are fuzzy. Um, so like I said, there's this one value, that the value of how many blocks a user is allocated. And if you think about the, the, the idea of a big uh, scientific computing cluster where one user is running a, a job on 100 computers and uh, they're all writing files, every allocation, every time you write, you would have to both check the current value of that, um, of the, the number of blocks the person is allocated, and it also has to change it. And if that was kept in one centralized place, every process on every computer would have to be constantly changing and looking at that value. Um, that would be a huge um, problem. So what happens is uh, we take the amount of space that's left uh, between the, the limit of the, of the user's quota and what they currently have and divide it up against the, the number of machines that are doing allocation. And so each one gets some, a certain portion of that. And you can, they can independently go through that amount of space before they have to go back, go back to the centralized uh, quota file and resync. And, and so basically, you uh, it, it, it breaks it up so that you aren't constantly getting the same um, that same value. And the problem with that is that you can get overruns if you have 
Uh, under certain situations where people allocate up to their limit and then stop and then other people are allocated. But you can, um, right, this is the next slide. Um, so, so you periodically synchronize the, the, the quota changes to the quota file. And um, you can also change, you sync them more often to get closer to the limit. So you can, um, there are a couple of options there. You, you can limit the maximum amount of overrun you have. Uh, or that's possible. And in, in theory, I, by default, it's, it's a twice overrun. Um, so you can make that smaller if you want. But in practice, you don't see anything more than, than 5 or 10%. And um, it's there and it works. Um, so withdraw is an, another um, feature that we have. So there, there, there are problems when you get errors. And um, you want one machine to be able to leave the cluster without in a way that other people can clean up for it and not kill that node, kill the node. So you want, if the machine has an IO error or if it's cargo to add, or if it has some sort of consistency or anything else, or if it's a code or a Basically the idea is that you want to rent or preserve the integrity of the cluster over that single node. So the, the previous way we were doing that was, was panicking, which of course users didn't like. Um, we added recently uh, this way of withdrawing so GFS has um, this, its own block device that layers between the regular block device and the file system. And it lets it, um, whenever it gets an I.O., that block device sees the I.O. Uh, so we can, whenever we get to the situation where we have to leave the cluster, we can um, stop any new I.O. and wait for any outstanding I.O. to, to complete. And once that happens, we can guarantee that GFS will not touch them just again. It can then leave the cluster. Um, or leave the cluster for that file system. And then calling the lock module to ask the lock module to do something that basically is equivalent of doing all the recovery steps on the number node except the transit part. So the node that, that had the problem stays up. So if you're running another uh, application, a non-GFS application on that node, that, that can stay up. Um, but you still preserve the cluster integrity and you keep your own like that. Um, so, so that's just another little improvement that we've ever used. Okay, so a bit about the lock module interface. So like I was saying, you can plug in multiple different lock um, methods of doing locking and cluster infrastructure with GFS. Um, you can plug in any one you want. There is a, a fair amount of context involved, so it's, it's a bit of work to do, but you can do it. Um, so, so the lock, kind of lock module interface is very lock-centered. Um, we call it lock module interface, not cluster interface. There's very simple clustering management. You can do um, a bunch of operations. You can map them out. That and you do it with blocks and block value blocks. And it's kind of something that max cluster would be a lot of idea. Um, and it handles all the internet communication. Um, okay, so uh, some of these parts that I was talking about earlier. So, GALM is a much less block and cluster manager. Uh, so, you can handle stuff that are already got in server. It's the current thing out in our realm three products. And um, so it's a membership form, uh, it does fencing, and locking for it. It's very IT specific. It's older than most of the code. Um, and one of the reasons we're keeping it around is there, there, we haven't done enough benchmarking yet to figure out when it would be better to do a centralized locking and when it would be better to do a distributed locking. Um, you can make very good arguments for a very large cluster where you do not want to go for a standard uh, distributed cluster transition. You have a thousand nodes all working in the cluster. Um, that basically those transitions often very really much scale with the number of nodes or the length of time it takes. So you can get better performance out of a, uh, a singleized or a centralized <coughs> membership, a one node that knows all the membership, uh, or potentially potentially you get better uh, results. And uh, so that's one of the reasons for keeping it around where. We want to be able to decide which one is better. Um, okay, so there's that, and then this new one that we're coming out will be uh, part of the Rail 4 product. So it'll be our 2.6 version of GFS and um, cluster infrastructure will come out with Rail 4 E1. Um, I think it's on the early summer. And um, so it's going to be using this new technology we have. So it's a cluster manager, which is kind of a fairly abstract. Um, 
cluster manager and a theoretical tree. So basically, it lets us expose this stuff um, to, um, to both GFS and CLVM. And we'd like to be able to connect or work together with the other uh, book applications. And we've been talking about integrating with the, the AJ stuff that Alan is doing and other things like that. So we're trying to keep things as modular as possible. We want multiple implementations of all of a sudden things plug well and basically work together as well as possible. Um, so, so you can use this, the stuff that we have now independently with CLVM and GFS. Um, you can write your own uh, stuff that goes to remote trunk space and interface. Uh, but it's new in the job. We're still testing it. And um, it's in QA now. And it should be ready um, like it did in the last couple of years. Um, and we can use it for a lot of different things. Okay, so cluster manager is uh, basically heavily based on VAX cluster. Uh, so the guy who's been writing it was a long time VAX cluster in the engineering of the interface. So he's been kind of modeling that for that. Uh, it handles network events. So you can ask it who's in the, the um, who are the cluster members now. You can ask it to tell me when somebody uh, shows up or when somebody goes away. Um, it also handles things like start and stop, so the core cluster. So things like when you have a cluster transition, you have to stop GFS and the VLAN for a while until you get the new membership set up. And once you have that, then you can tell the DLM to wake up and it <coughs> can do the lock recovery. And then once the lock recovery has to tell you to wake up, you have to do the recovery. And um, things can go on from there. Um, so so it handles literally with that level of starting and stopping services. Uh, like I said earlier, there's a separate user space stuff uh, that is corresponding to the Red Hat cluster suite that does the starting and stopping with Apache or IP alias. Or whatever you want to do that. Um, so you can access these commands from both the kernel and from the user space. Um, so GFS was one of the big reasons or things that, that use it in, in the kernel space and user space. CLVM is, um, is, is basically a game in the user space and um, uses it from there. Uh, it's currently in the kernel. Uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback from the community that, that say they um, the only problem with it is it is a lot of policy um, on how you want to do messaging, how you want to do cluster membership. And um, when we first started, we were going to do it all in the kernel, and we got good feedback from asking us in the user space. So we're working on doing that. Um, so each cluster has a unique name and ID. Um, so you can have multiple clusters on the network, um, but a node can only find one cluster. And each cluster can mount multiple processes. So you can have many processes mounted on one node. Um, so all nodes do broadcast and heartbeats. And when a node uh, detects that, that another node can't talk to another node, it goes to a cluster membership uh, transition where all, all the nodes um, agree on the cluster membership. It also does quorum. So quorum is very important in clusters. You want to make sure that you don't have a split frame um, type of uh, deal where you have a, a network cottage or something that has part of the cluster on one side and part of the cluster on the other, and they can't. Uh, each one doesn't know the other one's still alive. So do you really back both of them try to keep on changing the file system, thinking that the other one didn't exist? So quorum lets you count votes so each node or node in the cluster gets a certain number of votes. And you have to make sure that the, the side of the slip frame that survives has at least half of those, or more than half, or at least more than half of those. So it's a quorum. Um, it also provides these uh, services like I was talking to other um, you know, other things. So, so the, the RHA part of the equation gets these uh, node up and node down events, so it can do um, start and stop services. It also gets uh, our kind of thing that family gets these things so it knows who to kill um, to make sure that that person doesn't, doesn't come back later and start trying to write through this again. Um, so again, a bill in terminal user space. Um, so part of this, uh, so, so the core cluster manager does you know from the cabinet. But as I was saying, a GFS and the VLAB need uh, kind of a layer to cover. So people, so as soon as a cluster transition happens, the whole stack kind of, you might have three things running. You have your fence daemon running, you have your DLM, you have CLVM, you have 
JFS all running at the same time. When one of these transitions happens, JFS or the cluster manager needs to stop all of them and then do the figure out the lowest level, figure out who's in the cluster. And once you, that happens, then you need to wake up the fence payment, which will then kill the nodes. Make sure the nodes that you think are dead are actually dead. And then once that happens, you can do the DLM recovery and then do the CLA recovery and then you can do GFS recovery. So we have the service manager part that's part of the, the cluster manager that does that. So all these different uh, components kind of register at different levels and um, basically facilitate this layer recovery. Um, it's also symmetric. Um, so whenever you mount GFS or you start a lot of space in the DLM, it, the service manager knows what's happening and knows which nodes are participating in that. So, um, so if you have a, a node that goes down that you know is running GFS, you know to stop that node. You know, you know, you know, you know, um, so it, it, so like I said, the CNX man kind of the, the membership part of the, the cluster manager tells you this um, service manager when I know that they also want to come back in. And that the service manager manages the way of recovery. Um, okay, so the our, our DLM uh, looks very similar to the DLM max cluster. Like I said, the cluster manager is very similar. So you have big fans of uh, max clusters. Um, the spores are made different lock spaces, so each class can get its own lock space as it mounts. And you can acquire locks in there that may have the same name as the other one. Um, so a node when you mount a GFS or when the CLB starts finding it, it joins a lock space and wants to destroy that lock space and I'll start to find locks. Um, the DLM is currently run from kernel, um, and we're thinking that we'll probably keep it there because latency is just so important for something. Uh, in order to be able to keep us using a lot of files, there's one per file. The big factory, you can easily have hundreds of thousands of blocks in a period of time and be getting hundreds or, or even thousands of in a second. The latency is very important. Um, so we're thinking that the DLM will probably stay in there. Um, and it depends on cluster management. So, fencing. Um, so basically, it's a generic infrastructure that we've had. Um, we've been developing for a long time to support IO fencing. We have pluggable agents that come out of talk to different types of hardware. Um, so there are different types. So there's power supplies, a bunch of different nodes, and this power supply that's new in their corner. And you have nodes that you tell it to that port and tell it to uh, turn off the power on this node. And once the power's on, you know it's not going to come back and write the disk. Uh, I guess I should say that the situ situation you're trying to really avoid is a situation where a node goes away for a while. Um, it gets stuck in an interrupt or something and sits on the level land for an hour. And then something happens, somebody drops it and the cable gets jammed back in or, or something. And it comes back to life thinking that it was exactly the way it was before. And thinking it had, still had all the locks that it had before. Trying to write with the disk. And you'll get to the point where you have two different machines that think they have the same lock and start trying to write to the files that thinking they have the same lock. You can very quickly corrupt uh, your, your file system that way. So fencing prevents that. So it makes sure that the node you think is dead can't talk to the storage. Power cycling is one of those ways. Um, I.O. fencing is another. Uh, where there are a couple of types of fencing. There are fencing in the connection layer, so you can actually the fiber channel um, fabric, basically a, a, a switch of these fiber channel cards. You can tell the switch, don't let the guy talk to that disk. And um, that will prevent that situation where it picks up and if it tries to write to the disk, the switch will tell it how you can or the destruction happens. You can also do fencing in the IO device. Um, iSCSI has, um, well, all SCSI has a command called persistent reservation kind of built for this. Um, you can tell the disk, only talk to these guys, um, these five machines, or five HPAs. And then when you have a situation where a machine dies, you go back to that um, that storage device and tell it, okay, now take that guy out of the list and go talk to him again. Um, you can also do an iSCSI and this blocker refuge driver that we have lets you do it as well. Um, so 
basically lots of different places to do it. Different people have different preferences. So some people are nervous about the power stacking method because they don't want their machine um, forcibly power supplied and they can kill processes that are, that are running unrelated to the process. Um, some people don't want you to be messing with their um, their switch. That their switch and their sand is very complicated. Um, they don't want any kind of program going in and, and switching things. So did we have about 20 of the currently. You pick the one that works best for you. And um, to reach us out. Um, you, most of these agents are uh, scripts or small C programs. And so it's, it's pretty easy to write um, another method. The reason that these are quotations is we don't have it as documented as well as it should be. Um, so there is kind of a learning curve now, but uh, we, it, it's something we'll document sometime soon. And, um, or we're talking about and it's not really hard to write at the moment. Okay, so fencing kind of works differently between um, Gollum and the cluster manager. Uh, so Gollum, basically, there's a centralized server that knows what the cluster positions are, and it's the one that does fencing. Um, so it just what it has, there's this cluster configuration um, <coughs> system that we have that tells the uh, cluster for each node how to fence it. And um, the, the Gollum server looks up that node that it wants to fence and that it CCS. Figures out how to fence it and just issues a command that goes out to fence it. Um, but that's a very centralized thing, right? Um, so the, the cluster manager we're trying to be symmetric and as distributed as possible. So uh, it works a little bit differently for CNET. So each machine in, in the cluster manager have, runs its fencing data. It's a certain list that listens for requests. And um, <coughs> so whenever the cluster manager sees a, a cluster transition, it can go in and um, whoever gets to it first, or the cluster manager decides who's going to do the fencing. And um, it issues a command that they manage, which goes up and down the string, or the, the binary there. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so CCS, um, so cluster configuration system, um, we have these XML-based configuration files that um, define, there, there are a number of switches that get defined, but the biggest thing that's there, that, I mean, the cluster name is not the big one, um, but mostly it's there to define kind of fence nodes. Um, you can, uh, each node knows what its cluster name is. Uh, you can kind of figure out map IP addresses to names pretty easily, deciding that but the hard part is figuring out if you have this one node that I have to it. And that's basically what CCS is for. Um, in our earlier products, in our raw three product, there is this separate device. There are two devices per product. Per product. <coughs> well, there's one, there's this cluster configuration device in Raw3 that has this data on it in a centralized shared block device. And then you have the file system that is shared as well. Um, that, that's something that, that has worked in the past, but it's been kind of annoying because you have to have this shared device. Um, the, the new thing, in Rel, our new RHEL product, um, basically that will have a replication algorithm and, and what we kept as local files on the local file system. You know, no longer need shared storage. So that's a big improvement. Um, so CLVM, basically, uh, so it's a user space game that sits on top of uh, LVM2 and device network <coughs> and um, basically manages LockMS when you do a, a uh, you expand a LD, basically it will stop the whole cluster and that's the same thing. Do the update on this and then let everything be read the data in this area. So basically it lets you do the LD across the cluster. We're working on cluster mirroring and snapshot targets. So uh, cluster mirroring is actually a huge thing. Um, right now GMS requires shared storage. There's a block device that all of us see. What, some, what a lot of people have asked for is uh, say you have three nodes that each have an internal list you're not using. Um, it'd be really nice if you could have them all export their internal list to the network and then do cluster mirroring on top of that so that it's replicated across all three disks and then not JS on top of that. So you can build a cluster with quantity hardware without having an extra, um, a, an extra server node or a server failure repair. Um, so cluster mirroring is what's happening in cluster snapshots. Basically, it's great to have a cluster as well. Um, so, future work. Um, so, big short term product or targets. Uh, small file performances has been an issue in GFS, and it's something we are working on. Um, 
small flood style performance is really hard. Like I said earlier, because you're turning through is a very number of a large number of blocks, and you need to make sure that um, it, basically you have a lot of overhead. Um, journaling is also hard if you're, you're basically turning through a lot of metadata. So GFS has had some problems with that in the past, and we're working on and, uh, fixing things, doing better look ahead or read ahead of, of um, blocks, and um, kind of reworking our journal. That's where it's going to be on that you were doing uh, to get uh, things working better. Our FSC data has been slow in the past too. The Velcro product is a new FSC data that works a lot faster. Um, they'll probably get back for it in the Velcro as well. Um, and then local storage you can like um, what I was talking about. So that you can export local disks and have them um, all used by the group. Um, shared group, like I was talking about, it's something that or people have gone out and done in the field. It's not nearly as pretty as it should be. Um, so getting that package up nicely and getting good construction is something we're looking for. Um, Learn local uh, and database with big devices and things like that. So basically being smarter about where you locate things. Um, another example that comes up a lot is like a metropolitan, metropolitan area network where you have uh, a data center one place and a data center the other. Um, and you do mirroring so that if you have one building catch on fire, things can auto automatically tail over uh, to the other one. And um, being smart about what you do allocation and where you be, things like that, is important. Um, so block-based file backup. Backup becomes a huge problem in any large file system. Just spanning the tree uh, can take longer than that. It takes a copy of data on the tape. And it can take days, so if you're trying to do a day backup, um, you have a huge file system on any file system. It can take more than a day to, to actually go out and do uh, the shop. So if GFS marks which blocks get changed, it keeps a list of which blocks get changed, um, it can uh, speed that up by, by just telling the buyer to back to talk which blocks get changed. Um, these are more kind of, the farther out the future goes, the kind of farther out it is there. Uh, each reason set of allocation data maps is a big thing. Um, right now there are, we're pretty good about contention on good maps, so that if you go to one good map and you want to help get a good map and it's busy, you can go to a different one and do allocation. The place where the has a problem is if you are a file, you want to, um, to deallocate a block of the file, you have to go to the good map that contains that block in order to deallocate it. Um, the GFS, what we're talking about now is making it so that the allocation structure are tied to specific regions like this. And uh, the two makers of the allocation happens as a contention for the allocation. Um, and then how to cut elimination and uh, really figuring out if one disk is getting more than the other, so you can find it to be in a different place. Um, and some other, I don't know, the time is almost up. Thank <laughs> you. 